Hello and welcome back! In a previous video, I talked about electromagnetics and the main sources of electromagnetic interference on printed circuit boards. In this video, I'm going to take it a step further and show you my personal workflow when developing printed circuit boards for electromagnetic compatibility from scratch. First of all, let me just say that this is not a PCB design tutorial video. I assume that you are already familiar with KiCad, Altium Designer, Eagle or a professional CAD like that and I don't need to explain the smallest details of how those CADs work. Having said that, the first step in a successful design for EMC does not begin with CAD. It begins with a block diagram. Do not underestimate this step, as getting familiar with a block diagram also makes you familiar with the product itself. And I can guarantee you that if there is something on a block diagram that you don't understand very well, this is exactly the point where the issues are going to come from. So make sure to draw a block diagram and study it, and if there is something you don't understand, speak to someone superior. But before we jump into a practical block diagram, let's first recap the main parts that compose EMC. First, we've got radiated emissions that are measured in an anechoic chamber. Secondly, we've got conducted emissions, which are talking about emissions back into the mains, and we measure them with a low impedance stabilization network. Third, we've got electrostatic discharge, and this is a measurement of uh, contact discharge or air discharge that may come from somebody touching the unit or in another way. And finally, we've got surge protection, which is another test that is performed on mains powered equipment. Now that we know what we're looking for, we can look at the block diagram and try to understand what parts of the system are likely to cause those issues. So first of all, we need to establish if the product is mains powered. If it's not, then we don't need to consider conducted emissions and we don't need to consider surge protection. If it is, then we need to further establish if the switch mode power supply is designed by us or if it's an off-the-shelf module. If it is an off-the-shelf module, then there's nothing much we can do about it other than to put a filter on it. And we should do it regardless. We should make provisions for placing a filter inside the unit so that if it needs it, we will use it. And if it doesn't need it, we will not use it. By the way, remember that conducted emissions are all about emissions going back into the mains and not about emissions coming from the mains into your equipment. So to pass the test, you must filter out the frequencies that are generated in your box. But you may also want to filter out frequencies that are coming from external sources or from the switch mode power supply itself. However, this is a different story and is not required to do that to pass the conductor test. So let's consider a block diagram example. And for this video, I'm going to draw an example of a gigabit ethernet to USB converter. So in this kind of system, I'm going to start with drawing connectors input. So we're gonna have USB IO and we're gonna have gigabit ethernet IO then we kind of need to select a microcontroller for the job and I have and the best solution I have is the IMX RT1066 by NXP This is a pretty typical microcontroller and it has good availability those days, which is really important. Then, although this microcontroller has a USB PHY, it does not have an Ethernet PHY. So we also need to select an Ethernet PHY. And for this sort of application, I propose 
Broadcom, BCM 53134, which is a pretty good and easy to use FI in my opinion. Again, it has good availability in the market. So the way the system works is that we're gonna have a USB communication between IMX and the connector. And we're gonna have gigabit Ethernet communication here and let's just say that we're gonna have a mag jack so this kind of connector has transformers already integrated so you don't really have to worry about placing your own custom transformers and between IMX and BCM we're going to have an RGMII interface. As you're probably aware, USB traces need to be matched to 90 ohm differential impedance. So if this is USB 2.0, there's gonna be only two traces, D plus and D minus. And if there's uh, USB 3.0, there's gonna be a bit more complicated, but I'm not sure IMX actually supports USB 3.0. I think USB 2.0 is the only option here. Likewise for Gigabit Ethernet, you will also need to impedance match your traces, but this time to 100 ohm. And they should also be length matched. The same applies to USB traces as well. So those kind of things we can already predict just by looking at the block diagram. Unlike differential traces on USB and Gigabit Ethernet, RGMII is not differential signal. So those will have individual traces which need to be 50 ohm impedance matched. Now, as I consider this, I will now consider the crystal input. So I know that Broadcom will need 50 megahertz clock and uh, I'm going to add it here. For the IMX we're going to need 24 megahertz clock which is a typical clock for USB. Finally I'm going to also add the core frequencies for each device. So I know that IMX runs at 600 megahertz and Broadcom, it's going to take, depending on the operation, for RGMII, it's going to generate 125 megahertz clock signals. So this is going to be the highest frequency of operation and this is what I'm doing here. So I'm adding the frequency of operation for each IC in the system. And now that's completed, I will also add a power supply into this as well. So for IMX, we're going to need a 3 volt 3 DC DC converter and I'm going to specify max 17 623 then for the Broadcom chip we can do the same but this time the voltage will also be 1 volt 0 so actually 3 volt 3 will supply both parts but 1 volt 0 will only supply Broadcom because NXP has internal regulator and it does not need external for the core. Finally both of those regulators will be operating at 2 megahertz 
and we can learn that from the data sheet. One thing missing on this block diagram is the power source. So we have actually a few options. The first option is that we can use USB for power and in that case we can just take VBUS from USB connector and provide it as an input to our DC-DC converters. The other option is that we can use Gigabit Ethernet port for power over Ethernet and in that case we will get 48 volts out of it so we will need to regulate them down into 24 volt which we can do with an external module and then we will regulate 24 volts down to a voltage input suitable for this DC-DC converter which I believe is maximum 6 volts so I would typically regulate it down to 5 volts before feeding it into the MAX 1763 and the final option which I'm going to draw here is if we're gonna have a completely external AC input I don't know why would we have that it seems a little excessive but let's just consider this option and then we can have an SMPS block and that is going to be converted down to 5 volts which we will then feed into our regulators. So you may want to ask why wouldn't we get a switch mode power supply that is 3 volt free and supply NXP directly from it. Well the reason for that is because the frequency of operation of switch mode power supply is going to be around 100 kilohertz. So this is a problem because IMX is such a high frequency core device that it needs current really really fast and the 100 kilohertz switch mode power supply is simply not going to be able to cope with this demand. Also it is going to be located quite far away from the microcontroller and therefore the impedance of this connection is going to be significantly higher than when we place the DC-DC converter next to it. This is why I would typically add a few extra parts which may seem a little unnecessary but in actual fact from EMC perspective they are absolutely essential. Anyway, the next thing we can do on a block diagram is identify all parts of the system that may require ESD protection and by that I mean all external inputs and outputs that connecting your device to another device or somewhere else. Then we simply need to add TVS diodes on each pin of the connector and we should position those TVS diodes as close as possible to the connector. You should consider capacitance of TVS diodes when you place them. For high frequency signals and for audio signals you should not use TVS diodes with capacitance higher than 10 picofarad. However, low capacitance TVS diodes are much more expensive. So I typically have two sets of diodes on an average PCB where I use one set for audio and high frequency and another set for everything else. You would typically place your TVS diode directly on the path of the signal, not on another layer and not with a separate trace as it will compromise the performance of TVS diode and you will also provide a clear return path. So by that I mean that the ground connection must be made direct as possible straight to the plane. Sometimes for balanced line you will also need to provide a degree of protection between positive and negative signal. This subject really requires a separate video and I do intend to make one in the near future. I have also mentioned surge protection and even though adding surge protection is only required when you're designing your own AC-DC converter, I can tell you that this protection usually relies on a crowbar circuit in a switch mode power supply. So if you have access to schematics, double check that it is present in a switch mode power supply design and if it isn't, make sure you speak to someone about it.